Good morning. Uh, my name is Bill Keffer. I'm with the law firm of Montgomery McCrack and Walker and Rhodes. I'd like to welcome you all to our seminar here this morning. Uh, hopefully you got good breakfast and good coffee. Um, I'd first off like to start out by thanking Phil Langford because uh, Phil brought his laptop and without Phil's laptop today, and Phil's just a random guy who showed up here, we, would, we wouldn't have this. So thank you, Phil. Um, our seminar today is 10 opportunities for your business under the new tax law. The words practical and clearly understandable are usually not ever heard in a discussion involving the tax law. This morning, however, our esteemed panelists are going to do exactly that. They're going to give you 10, okay, maybe a little bit more than 10, very practical and very clearly understandable opportunities that exist as a result of the new tax law. Uh, the way we're going to proceed, we're going to start out with Scott Isdainer. Scott's going to talk about the new tax law, just give an overview. Uh, Gary Edelson, who's a tax lawyer at Montgomery McCracken, is going to then dive into uh, a number of opportunities from a tax perspective, so to speak. Uh, Howard Vigerman, also at Montgomery McCracken, is going to talk about some opportunities from a trust and estates perspective. And then Scott's going to finish up with uh, about three or four opportunities uh, as well. We're going to try to get you out of here by 10 o'clock this morning. We're also, if there is time, we're going to have a little question and answer. I mean, it is tax. It is heady. Uh, there's oftentimes lots of questions. We'll try to uh, have the questions held for the end and, and save about 10 minutes or so after that. So without further ado, Scott. Thank you. I take it this is not working. So I'll just uh, project. I can do that. Good morning. Um, I'm Scott Isdaner, and welcome. I'm so glad you could join us this morning, and I am uh, really thrilled today to be with my colleagues from Montgomery and Kraken to uh, hopefully leave you today with uh, a group of opportunities that you can start considering for yourselves or, or for your clients or others that you advise in, uh, in with respect to their business dealings. My goal this morning to start the uh, program is basically to put sort of a wrapper around the new tax bill for you so that when Gary steps up in a few moments to dive into some of the specific provisions that create business opportunities, you at least have a framework upon which this is, uh, this is based. So let's get started. Um, the, new, the new law was actually enacted about six months ago in December of 2017. Uh, although it uh, appeared in many, in many of the uh, press announcements that this was a piece of rushed legislation, uh, I think it's important that you all are aware that many of the provisions in this bill were provisions that had been circulating for multiple years uh, through Congress, uh, particularly um, uh, Congressman Ryan and Camp, who had been proposing tax reform legislation for multiple years but were unable to move it uh, because of the makeup of the uh, political nature of the, of the government at that point. Uh, so many of these things were things that have been circulating, we have been watching and known about, but there are a group of provisions in this new bill that are new, uh, unexpected, and are the ones that are the most troublesome because they have the least amount of guidance and the least definitions, and we'll be talking about that shortly. Uh, the bill is very comprehensive and far-reaching. It's going to affect virtually every taxpayer in the country. For the most part, the law is effective beginning in 2018, although there are some significant provisions that had effective dates that were earlier. Um, areas of depreciation and acquisition of, uh, of assets actually came into effect towards the latter part of 2017, so we have many clients who are benefiting from that already in their 2017 tax, tax returns. Uh, home mortgage interest, which I'm not going to discuss today, uh, was, was also changed effective for uh, transactions that occurred in 2017. There are some modifications in the medical expense deduction rules to the benefit of taxpayers and in the foreign income area, uh, dealing with repatriation of uh, foreign income. That all were effective last year as well. Um, as I mentioned, there are many unanswered questions in this new tax bill, and we are all as professionals waiting for guidance at this point in time to be able to finalize some of the planning that we're starting to discuss with our clients. Um, 
So on an overview, what, what really happened in this new, this new legislation? The biggest uh, issue and the one that got the most press was that tax rates are coming down. Uh, and I'm going to talk briefly in a moment about what some of those rate reductions are. But there are cross, cross the board tax rate reductions in the bill. <coughs> to offset that, keep in mind that to, to, give, to, give, to give something, you sometimes have to take away. And, and the takeaway that occurred in this legislation was a reduction or elimination of many itemized and other types of deductions that taxpayers have been relying on for years. So think of this law in general as a, as a law that reduced rates but broadened the tax base. So although rates went down, the, uh, the number upon which you're applying that rate is often going to be going up. Many of the provisions, in order for these law to have met fiscal revenue neutrality laws to enable to be passed by a simple majority in Congress, have sunset provisions. Uh, generally, most of the provisions that are that impact individual taxpayers will sunset after the tax year 2025. So we're going to be reverting back to the law as it existed before 2018. Uh, at that point in time, unless these provisions are extended or modified by Congress in the future. Uh, again, the law was designed to meet revenue neutrality rules, so it enabled this law to be passed by a, a simple majority in Congress. Uh, if it did not have that and it went out too long with a revenue loss, it would have required a, major a super majority, which would not likely have occurred with the uh, makeup of the uh, Democratic Republican mix in Congress at this time. So, in terms of rates, individual rates, every bracket has been decreased for the most part. The top new tax rate is 37%, which is a reduction from the prior year top rate of 39.6%. There are no changes in this law in terms of the tax rates for free with capital gains or qualified dividends. Uh, however, the brackets upon which these, the rates to which they're applied have changed. So uh, capital gains can, will now under the new law be taxed at lower rates than they were under prior law, depending on the taxpayer's level of taxable income. The provision in the law that was passed as part of the Affordable Care Act, which enacted a new 3.8% net investment income tax several years ago, has been retained. So uh, client, people who are still paying, earning um, investment income over a certain threshold will be subject to the continuation of this rate at this point. Even though there were modifications in the Affordable Care Act and a reduction in, uh, in compliance requirements, th this tax has continued. Uh, they couldn't get rid of it. The cost was so high, they, they, they were unable to find a way to get some additional revenue to offset the reduction of it. Uh, the big winner in the legislation, which I'm sure you've all seen in all the press, is uh, the tax rates on corporations. Uh, that, that rate has been reduced from a top rate of 35%, to now a flat tax rate of 21%. So this is, uh, this is where there's been a lot of discussion and uh, something that everyone should be aware of. Uh, flow through entities, partnerships, limited liability companies, uh, corporations that are structured as subchapter S corporations in which their income is taxed to their owners. They are, their income is subject to the same rates as individuals. However, there's a new provision which uh, Gary's going to speak about which effectively will reduce the potential top rate on income generated by those companies to a rate of 29.6% versus 37%. And uh, that, that, that's through the use of a deduction. And again, Gary's going to focus on that in his comments. Perhaps the, you're going to turn me on? How's that? Was it better the other way or is this? <laughs> The, the biggest uh, piece of this legislation that got the most press was the rules that are changing and limiting the deductions for state, local, and real estate taxes paid by taxpayers. In the past, you were allowed an unlimited deduction for tax income, state and local income taxes that you paid and real estate taxes that you paid as an itemized deduction as a reduction of your normal adjusted income. Under the new law, this limitation has been significantly limited to now allowing only a maximum deduction of $10,000 for the total amount of taxes paid in those categories. Uh, this is the one that got the most press. It's the one that got a lot of uh, the high tax states up in arms 
uh, New York, California, New Jersey, where there are significant income taxes and significant real estate tax obligations. Uh, many of our clients, as we're starting to do projections of their tax consequences under this new law, those living in those states are the ones that are most impacted adversely as a result of uh, some of these some of these changes. Uh, just as a uh, core item that you should be aware of, um, the standard deduction for taxpayers that don't itemize their deductions has been almost doubled to $24,000 for married taxpayers filing jointly from $12,700. There are going to be some planning issues here with the reduction in uh, state and local tax and real estate tax deductions. Many, many people will no longer be itemizing their deductions and using standard deductions, and that gives rise to some planning considerations. I'll address a couple of them later on today. Uh, the exemptions that used to be available for you, for you, your spouse, your children, for personal exemptions, that's been repealed and does not exist under the new law. Again, remember, all this sunsets and comes back into play in 2026. So uh, we'll see what happens. Um, Gary's going to speak about a new section. We don't, I'm not here to talk about code sections, but I wanted you to see one that you're going to hear because this is the, the one code section getting a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of planning press and opportunities, and that's new section 199A. This is a provision that's going to allow flow-through entities to avail themselves of a deduction of up to 20% of their income as a reduction to the owner's other income, which in effect will reduce the amount of income they're paying tax on and reduce their rate, as I mentioned before, from a top rate of 37% to a top rate of 29.7%. Uh, um, this is one of the most uh, complicated provisions in the new law. It has a series of undefined terms, and uh, as I said, Gary's going to spend quite a bit of time on that because it's really the most critical issue for, for those of you who are operating through flow-through entities to avail yourselves of this benefit. Other items that we're going to be addressing, and I'm just going to highlight some of the things that we're going to be addressing as we go through the program today. Um, there is a new provision in the law that is going to limit uh, significantly the availability of interest deductions taken by businesses to support its borrowings. In the past, if a company borrowed money and incurred interest, they were able to deduct that interest as a reduction of their income. The new law places limitations on the amount of interest that can be deducted uh, based on a whole series of, of tests. This will definitely impact highly leveraged companies. It will also impact, uh, as you can imagine, the real estate industry uh, because of the high leverage nature of, of holdings of real estate. However, throughout this legislation, there are carve-outs to benefit real estate. We're not sure how or why real estate was carved out as a separate, um, <laughs> as, 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 a, uh, as, as a special component. Uh, we can just, can just make some guesses on that. But um, in, 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 this, in, in this area in particular in interest, there is, uh, there is a very significant carve-out that enables real estate companies to continue to avail themselves of interest deductions. There's a penalty cost, but as you'll hear later when Gary speaks about this, it's, uh, it's, it's far less onerous than the loss of the deduction. Uh, disallowed in interest will get, we'll have carryover provisions, and there are many thresholds as to what companies are subject to this, and uh, the rules again will be discussed. Another uh, undiscussed issue in this new law, which is very important, is that the law imposes a new limitation on the ability of, of taxpayers to utilize losses that they generate from businesses in which they're actually actively and materially participating in to use those losses to offset income they generate from other sources, like investment income or wages. Um, this, this provision uh, also has a series of thresholds and limitations. Um, losses that are disallowed under this rule will carry over. Uh, but they carry over in a different, cap different capacity, which also has some limitations imposed on that. Uh, short, short story on this, and again, Gary's going to cover it in more detail. <coughs> Losses in excess of $500,000 will be disallowed under the new law, but you do get a pass on that first $500,000 to be able to use those types of losses against other income. Uh, one of the big winners in this legislation were people who are buying and acquiring assets for use in their trader business. 
Uh, the depreciation and expensing of asset acquisitions was greatly expanded and liberalized. Uh, there are significant opportunities to uh, now write off virtually all, all purchases and acquisitions of assets and equipment. Uh, again, Gary's going to speak a little bit more about this uh, shortly. Um, it, just as a comment, one of the reasons why the interest rules, the limitations I spoke about, were put into place was because uh, Congress didn't want everyone to have their cake and eat it too. So it, they didn't want companies to be able to go out and highly leverage purchases of equipment, be able to write off those acquisitions as a deduction, and then also be able to deduct in full the interest they incur when they've leveraged those purchases. So the, uh, the, the give back from the additional depreciation was this limitation on interest. Uh, there are a series of liberalizations and modifications in the accounting uh, world under the new tax law. Uh, the, most, uh, the most important one for uh, companies is if you, uh, if you have income levels below certain thresholds, which are in the tens of millions of dollars, you're actually able to utilize the cash basis of uh, accounting for tax purposes as opposed to the accrual method. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but for, uh, for some companies, this, uh, this could be a valuable change. There are costs and analyses that have to be done if you want to convert from one method to another, but the, uh, the new law does permit a conversion if it's beneficial. Uh, the last item, uh, which is one I get booed off stage about uh, often, is um, the, the new law has significantly uh, impaired the ability to deduct uh, meals and entertainment expenses, mostly in the area of entertainment expenses. I'm going to speak about this a little bit later on, but in, in effect, all entertainment expenses that were previously allowed are now uh, no longer deductible by, by companies and businesses. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that briefly later. So with that, I'd like to turn over to Gary to uh, get started on some of the more details. I uh, hope this gives you a good idea of what the new law provides, and uh, enjoy the detail now. Gary? <coughs> okay. Probably the most important uh, uh, section of the new tax law is the new 199 Cap A. Uh, what it provides for is a 20% deduction on business income. Uh, uh, if your income is below a certain threshold, uh, for married people it's 315000 half that for separate return. There's no limitation on, on the deductibility of 20%. The, the main attribute is that it has to be business income. It doesn't matter whether it's passive business income or active, uh, uh, but it does have to be business income. The, uh, uh, if your income is above the 315 level, then uh, uh, two things happen. If you're in the unfavored class of businesses, which are primarily the licensed professions and any other business that where the, basically you're selling the personal services of, of one or more people, uh, then if the income is above the 315 level, there's a severe cutback on the 20% on the deduction. If you're outside of that class of businesses, uh, then a alternate calculation kicks in. Uh, and the alternate calculation is 50% is, uh, of W-2 wages paid to all the employees, or the alternative, 25% uh, of the wages plus 2.5% of basis of, of depreciable assets. And this gives rise to a lot of planning opportunities uh, because if you're a business that has no employees and you're above the 315, well, you're not, the, the phase out is going to hit you very hard. Uh, so that uh, one of the things you can do is hire more employees and take a look at whether you have independent contractors and say, well, do I have to have them as independent contractors and how much do I have to adjust their wages to, to get square because you know, uh, I, as an employer, you have the, half the social security tax, so you have to think about that. Uh, you can also buy more depreciable assets. That'll help. Uh, uh, one technique that, that seems to work is to hold your real estate in a separate legal entity and lease it over. It has to be an active lease as opposed to a triple net lease because it has to be business income. Uh, and the rental income minus the deductions is going to be eligible for the 20% deduction so that you can uh, use that as a technique. So you could have 
uh, for example, a law firm which is in the unfavored class, owning its office building, leasing over the real estate, and get your 20% deduction on the, the net rental income. Of course, the rent has to be arm's length, and, and so you just can't have a, you know, no, no profit from your uh, professional activity and all your profit baked into your, to your rent. Uh, this does give an opportunity because the 315 is, is applied at every uh, uh, taxpayer level, or the 157 if, in case of uh, uh, separate returns. There's some planning opportunities of spreading the ownership. For a long time, due to the kitty tax, uh, you never thought about putting pieces of your business in the names of children or trusts for children. Uh, now, with the 20% deduction, if you're already at the 315 level, you can at least carefully think about, well, how about if I transfer a piece of my pass-through entity to a trust uh, or multiple trusts for children? Uh, although the tax rate goes up faster, you can avail yourself of the 20% deduction. And if your income is already at the top rate, uh, there's no extra uh, tax cost for doing that. Uh, uh, the, the new law also gives a bit of an advantage to S corporations over LLCs, or, or for that matter, limited partnerships. Uh, and the advantage is that you can actually be a W-2 employee of your own S corporation. And mathematically, if you have no other employees, if you set your salary at around two-sevenths of the bottom line profit of your pass-through entity, you will maximize your 20% deduction because the uh, your 50% of wages will hit the optimum uh, point. If you have other employees, then uh, you don't have to set your own wage quite so high. Uh, it's also an opportunity, if you're a sole proprietor, to hire your spouse or children in the business if the type of activity permits it. Uh, but this does give rise to a lot of planning opportunities, and uh, uh, you ought to take advantage of them. Gary, Gary mm -hmm. just to, to follow up on that comment about the S-corporations, the IRS has always had a, um, a concern that because the income generated from a subchapter S corporation is not subject to self-employment or, or, or social security tax, that taxpayers would take low salaries and leave a lot of their profits in the company as a way to avoid that tax. So e even in this case, as you plan for your salaries, you still have to be concerned that that, that the amount of salary you take still has to be appropriate for the Correct. services Correct. that you're mm -hmm. providing. That's right. You, you, uh, you can't uh, uh, artificially inflate your own salary uh, outside the reasonable range. Uh, but within that reasonable range, uh, you're, you're OK. Uh, you're not going to take no salary because the <coughs> judicial precedent shows that if what you're taking is really wages, uh, the IRS is going to want the Social Security tax. Is there something you wanted me to talk about? Uh, if you wish. Do um, you want me to talk this one? Uh, you can hear me? Yeah. It, as a, just as a, a, a continuation of some of the comments that, that Gary made about hiring more employees, one of the, um, one of the areas that we've been looking at are uh, clients of ours that are sole proprietors. So sole proprietors, as a, as a definition, are not taking salaries. They're just earning their own profits every year. So the ability to avail themselves of this new 20% deduction, if they're earning income over that $315,000 threshold amount, could be severely limited or, or, or eliminated because they have no wages. One of the w ways to start to think about this is to talk to the client to see if their spouse or, or children may be uh, participating or available to provide services that would give rise to the ability to pay them wages. Uh, that, that wage amount then would give rise to the ability to take a 20% deduction um, on, on some of that income, if not all of it, earned by that sole proprietor based on the level of wages that you pay. You have to be very careful in just adding someone to your payroll because you have to, first of all, the salary has to be reasonable. I, I, I'm not going to go into the details in that, but you know, you, it, it's hard to pay a spouse $100,000 who's opening your mail one day a week. Um, but on the same line, 
once you add a spouse or a child to your payroll, you're. Uh, can we hire them to take papers? <laughs> yes, you can hire them to take papers together. Exactly. Uh, and, that, and that's a highly skilled service. So, uh, um, yes. So, but you have to compare. Once you add someone to payroll, you're now going to be incurring payroll tax costs as a result of having an employee, both in terms of your, your, your spouse having to pay half of the Social Security taxes and your, your company having to pay half. So you have to actually do the mathematical calculation to see at what level the salary has to be and what services are provided to see if the tax benefit of getting this deduction kicks in. Uh, just one little added benefit on this is if, if you have somebody who has had low earnings over the years and you can add them in and they're now starting to get larger earnings, it may increase their social security benefit sometime in the future when they retire, which is just uh, maybe an added plus in all this. <coughs> and, uh, the other point, which is also uh, Gary just spoke about, uh, is you really have to review your real estate lease arrangements when your operating entities are, um, are leasing properties owned by the owners of that operating entity, it, it has to be a fair and reasonable rent. And, and the, the point Gary made is really critical. The, the rental income to qualify for this new limitation really has to, the lessor really has to be doing enough activity to qualify as a trader business. You may want to, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, but, uh, in, in the leasing careful. world, um, there's, uh, a distinction between very passive rents, you know, triple net lease is the typical example, versus an, an active lease. An active lease is a trader business eligible for the 20% deduction. A triple net lease would be considered too passive because it's not a trader business, and therefore it's not eligible for the deduction. So you, if you're going to use the related party lease, you have to maybe rethink the lease uh, and figure out what is the landlord's obligations and put as many active landlord obligations as you can on the, on the landlord. Yes? And that could be as simple as the landlord hiring the, the cleaning service and the landlord sure. covering the electric or whatever. Sure. Right. Uh, snow removal, that type of thing, cleaning the sidewalks. Uh, uh, anything that can, you can do to be in an active trader business. And, and this is this is probably the opposite of most leasing arrangements between these operating companies and the owners who own the real estate, where it's been triple net lease, where the only thing the uh, real estate company is doing is collecting rents, paying real estate taxes, and maybe a mortgage interest, and that's mm -hmm. it. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Another area that, that you have to think about, and this isn't coming up on that particular slide, is aggregation of the business. As I indicated, that, that there is a line of businesses that are not eligible except where the income is below the 315 level. It's basically the licensed professions and a few others. Mysteriously, architects and engineers were carved out of it. They've got great lobbyists. Uh, I, what you what you think people are thinking of is breaking up the business into two or more businesses. For example, a law firm puts all the uh, billing activity or something in a side entity and charges the law firm fees for it. Uh, an accounting firm could probably have the same opportunity. Uh, I'm sure brokerage industry could figure out you know similar opportunity. We won't know until we get regulations how harsh the Internal Revenue Service is going to be on that type of activity. The other planning point that is very um, uh, key in the real estate industry is because of the, uh, once you're over the 315 threshold, the W-2, 50% W-2 wages, in some industries, and real estate happens to be a typical one, they have a management company where all the employees are sitting there working for one entity, and they just pay a, the operating partnerships uh, that have just own real estate, you know, a fee for a bundle of <coughs> services. Well, if the ultimate regulations allow you to aggregate the, the multiple the, uh, and treat it as one business, then you can have your employees here and your businesses with no employees over on the side and aggregate at the partner level. On the other hand, if the service comes down and says it's entity by entity, you're going to have to rethink those types of arrangements. One thing I can think of is 
having the employees of work for all the entities and having a co uh, uh, paymaster arrangement so that technically the W-2 salaries are showing up in every partnership return or every LLC return uh, using a portion of, the, of those salaries. Um, another item which is, is an unknown is whether the Internal Revenue Service is going to attribute to the technical employer or the user of the service employees that work for a staffing company where technically they're employees of the staffing company and the, the user of the services pays a fee. There's some reason to believe because of, of the old 199 regulations that the IRS will allow the staffing company to pass through and treat the user of those services as if they were the, the employer for the purpose of this calculation. But we're not going to know that until regulations are issued or some pronouncements come going to uh, issue. But that's like least employee. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's a big deal in certain industries. Uh, uh, the next uh, important area is, uh, is deductibility of interest. Okay. In the prior time, interest was deductible if the interest was incurred in the trader business. There were special rules for uh, interest incurred in investment activities. Now you have to run through a, a calculation. Uh, First, there's a couple exceptions. One is, is if your business has average income for the last three years of less than 25 million, it doesn't apply. Okay, so that's you know one one handy exit. Okay, another handy exit is an election by a active real estate business to elect out of these limitations. But the price of that, which is not too high is that you have to slow down your depreciation using the alternate system. Uh, in the case of residential real estate, that's now 30 years. In the case of uh, uh, non-residential, that's 40 years. It's not that bad compared to the normal rules, which are, uh, uh, so it's worth making the election, but you have to think through that election and decide whether you want to do it or not, okay? Um, one of the, uh, attributes of the, the new rule is that it only applies to interest. It doesn't apply to other forms of yield uh, that inure to the uh, investors. So one of the things you, you may well see in the future is lenders being asked to be partners or members of an LLC with preferred return yields on, on the uh, LLC interest. So instead of the business activity having, you know, lots and lots of debt on the balance sheet, what you're going to see is the lenders as preferred members uh, getting a preferred return on their investment. Uh, uh, another uh, another thing you have to be very careful of is related party loans. You know, when you're thinking of okay, the investors are coming into it, an entity, and some people say, well, I'll put in as little as as possible as, as uh, equity and take uh, and, and lend in the balance. Well, you're not going to want to do that anymore because the the, the lim uh, interest limitation is 30 percent of what is called adjusted income. For the next couple of years, that uh, is bef uh, after depre I mean, sorry before depreciation. It's a fairly high number. Then it sinks down in about three years to after depreciation, which is going to be a low number. Uh, uh, so that the, uh, what you want to avoid is having half of your money or three quarters of your money come in as, as borrowed capital, especially to related party uh, lenders. It is, uh, you have to also or think through not only that, the limitation on the deduction, but the problem of the deduction for the interest being limited while the, the, the lender still has to report the interest. So you have the kind of the worst case scenario where your interest is suspended being carried forward, okay, but the lender still has to pick up the interest income. So you have to really think through the capitalization structure of your, of your business enterprises now. Uh, in the case of a partnership, okay, this calculation is done at the entity level, so you measure 30% of adjusted income at the partnership, okay. What it, if interest is not allowed 
it isn't suspended, the partnership drops to the partner. However, the partner has to wait until that partnership produces income above the 30% level in order to ever take that interest deduction. It just sits there. Okay? It reduces their basis and their partnership interest, but it just sits there. Okay? Now, um, a, a slightly different rule uh, for an S corporation. If an S corporation hits that limit, okay, it just keeps riding along at the S level. It doesn't seem to pass through to the partner. Uh, uh, so it's you know, a, a, a te just a technical rule. Uh, uh, the, uh, where, wherever the partnership has income above the limit, then that frees up suspended interest. And only where the partnership has uh, the active business income above the 30% threshold can the, bot, can the partner avail themselves of that extra if they borrowed personally and have an interest deduction at the personal level. Gary, going back to the, um, the real estate election, mm -hmm. it, it's, um, I'm, I'm anticipating for those real estate companies that are exceeding the threshold of, uh, of, of being subject to the provision, that that's going to be a pretty easy dis decision to make, to make that election to, uh, to go out, because as, as you mentioned, the, 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 the decreasable life of, of non-residential non real estate is going to go instead of 39 years under the current law to 40. You're, you're, you're talking about stretching every depreciation over virtually no no additional time frame. Mm -hmm. and residential yeah. from 27 yeah. and a half to 30. It, it's going to be pretty much a no-brainer. That. That, that's yeah. right. And you still have your Section 179 deductions for uh, certain items. So uh, that, ma that making of that election is going to be pretty standard. The, the next item that, that people have to, to be conscious of, that in, under prior law, if you had losses coming through pass-through entities or a sole proprietorship, and you had income from other sources, they netted out at the, at the person, at the taxpayer level. You always had the passive activity loss rules. You always had the basis uh, problem. But, but basically, things netted out on the personal return. Well, no more. Uh, there's a new section that says you can only deduct losses, assuming they're otherwise deductible under the passive activity loss rules, the basis rules, and all the other old limitations to the, um, to the extent of $500,000 of uh, other forms of income. So in your, if you're in a, a, a multiple entity uh, arrangement, okay, uh, or even a single entity arrangement, and you're taking a salary of two million dollars a year and the entity is producing a loss, well you have just sh shot yourself in the foot because you're only going to be able to take the loss to offset the first 500,000 of the salary in, uh, income and the rest is going to be suspended and when it gets suspended it becomes part of the NOL calculation and under the new rules uh, NOLs are only can offset 80 percent of the income so what you're going to want to do is look at your forms of income and limit all the other forms of non-business income uh, so to, to uh, half a million dollars. Same thing with related party loans. You see a lot of people picking up tons of interest because they have lent their various business entities uh, money. They're picking up the interest that yet they have some, some losses and they're taking uh, the interest can't be offset by the losses except to the extent of the half a million dollars. So that the thinking of how do I take my income uh, has to be reconfigured. Also, if you have portfolio income, somebody who has you know, a nice portfolio of marketable securities is producing interest and dividend income, they also have losses from, say, a rental activity. Okay. Well, that loss isn't going to be offsetting their their income from the uh, uh, from the portfolio anymore, except to the extent of the first five hundred thousand dollars. So they got to, you know, uh, uh, ask the question: Well, what do I want? How do I want to earn income, at, and in what form? Okay. 
The next area, which is probably the one that's uh, uh, taking the most ink on the Wall Street Journal, is do I want to be a C corporation or a pass-through entity? It used to be, well, I never wanted to be a C corporation unless I was going to go public uh, two years from now. So let me be an LLC or an S corporation. And should we become, you know, want to become a publicly traded company? It's easy to revoke an S election or incorporate the LLC. Now it's really a harder decision to make because you have a, at the, if you're a C corp, you have a flat 21%. And there's no limitation on deductibility of state and local taxes. Those rules didn't change for a C Corp. Now when you're a pass-through entity, you have to ask the question, am I going to be eligible for the new Section 199 Cap A deduction? If the answer is yes, chances are you're better off in a pass-through entity because if you earn your money at the C Corp level and you want the money, then you have to take it out as a dividend. And if you combine the the uh, tax on the dividend income plus the 21% at the corporate level and state and local tax, you're at a higher rate than if you just paid a single tax uh, with the 20% deduction, which comes out to 29.6%. Okay? Uh, uh, an additional uh, 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 thing they have to factor in is, am I going to sell the business? If you're a C corporation, Okay. You can only do a stock sale. You could do an asset sale, but the corporation is going to have to pay a tax at the corporate level and then distribute the cash to the shareholders in liquidation. Well, that's double taxation. If you add the two taxes, that's higher than a single tax. What's also driving this is now the bonus depreciation. If under prior law, bonus depreciation only applied to new equipment now it applies to new or used equipment as long as it's bought from an unrelated person. Well, if you are buying a business that is heavy in equipment, you can literally deduct the, the original cost of the, of the business by buying assets. And if you're a really large buy, you know, publicly traded company buying some smaller uh, business, that's a, a basically an immediate expense of your cost to your business. Well, if you're a C Corp, you can't do that. So you have to, that uh, suggestion that was branded about, well, let's all be C corporations, has to be well thought out. The area where being a C corporation can make sense, however, is where you, for whatever reason, you can't take the, the cash out of the business. You may be heavily loaded with debt. Uh, you may have a business that needs every nickel to uh, you know, survive, and that the and that the uh, relevant the management team is going to take out uh, virtually nothing because they will, they're they're working for that ultimate reward, the payday on on a sale. Uh, that's where being a C corporation can make sense. Uh, the other area is where you have a lot of foreign income. Uh, I'm not going to touch on those rules today, but technically the uh, new benefits for, for uh, uh, earning income basically overseas uh, in your, uh, to C corporations, not to individuals, so that if you have a lot of foreign activity, you might want to be a C corporation. Uh, I, uh, another thing that, that has to be taken into account is the deductibility of state and local tax. If you're a, in a, a high tax jurisdiction for individuals, such as New York City or California, uh, uh, that deduction, that $10,000 cap on deducting the uh, uh, state and local tax um, can really bite. Well, there's no cap uh, uh, on a C corporation, so you might want to think about uh, that. Uh, more often than not, you, you got to decide, well, uh, great thinking about it, but not for me. Uh, but there are going to be exceptions. Okay, next topic. Uh, you probably all read in, New in uh, Wall Street Journal about bonus depreciation, and you probably all read about you know, the 179 deduction. Uh, what's new is the 179 deduction a dollar amount was put at a million dollars, uh, 
it, you do have to have a trader business, so it doesn't apply to something that's passive, that's not a trader business. And they enhanced the 179 deduction to include some uh, improvements to non-residential real estate, uh, roofs and, and uh, heating systems and so forth, and also interior improvements to non-residential real estate. So that's you know uh, new. The bonus depreciation, which is under the, the depreciation rules, basically applied to now new equipment or used equipment. Uh, uh, this is driving, as I indicated before, how acquisitions are done because if a business has a lot of equipment, the buyer can virtually deduct you know, 100% of the cost of the business. Uh, it's also just driving decisions of timing. Uh, you know, the bonus depreciation sounds great, but a lot of times you can't use all the deduction all in one year. So you have some options. One is to elect out of the bonus depreciation, but you have to do that for all items in the same class. So it's a it's kind of an all or nothing uh, type election. You can't pick and choose. The other thing you can do is time your purchases. You know, ask the question: Well, do how many how much equipment do I want to purchase this year? How much do I want to purchase next year? Uh, uh, so that you can spread the deduction in, in over the different years. Uh, Running through an, an NOL doesn't make any doesn't make economic sense under the new rules because an NOL can only offset up to 80 percent of the income, not 100 percent of the income. Okay. The last item that of a very technical nature uh, that I want to get to uh, is the new rule on advance payments. Under prior, under, it is well settled that under a cash method of accounting, if you receive an advance payment, that's income immediately. Under the accrual method of accounting, for gap purposes, not so. However, under prior uh, uh, tax law, the general rule is that if an accrual basis taxpayer received an advance payment, that was income in the year uh, of received. There was no, there was certain. Um, revenue procedures that allowed uh, uh, modest deferral. Under a new code section, uh, there's two things that became important. The first is the general rule that uh, you may elect to, if you're accrual, to include in the first year of a prepayment only that amount which you are uh, reporting on your financial statements and report the balance in the second year. Okay. Under the financial statement rule is that whatever you report for financial statement purposes, you have to report for tax purposes. So you can no longer have a uh, higher amount reported for gap purposes than you do for tax. Uh, so the two are now semi-coordinated. And before you enter into an arrangement that calls for an advance payment, you ought to be checking with your uh, accountants to ask, well, how much of that income do I have to, am I going to report for gap purposes or financial statement purposes? Because the two are now coordinated. And the thing you don't want to do is have advanced payments for the next five years worth of income. Because once these rules apply, you're going to be being reported in two years the five years worth of income and have to pay tax right up front. Okay. Hi, I'm Howard Vickerman. I'm a trust and estates lawyer at Montgomery McCracken, and I'm going to be spending a few minutes talking about the estate and gift tax changes under the new law, and also some planning opportunities for trusts, which Gary briefly touched on. So. Hopefully, I know more tax law than I do technology. Um, So under the new tax law, um, a lot of people may think that the world of estate planning has sort of disappeared because the federal estate tax exemption, which 
used to be in 2017, $5,490,000 has been increased per individual to $11,180,000, which means that for a married couple, it's $22,360,000. Um, and the portability rules, which allow the carrying over of one spouse's exemption to the other spouse still apply. So that most people won't have to pay federal, state, or gift tax, or generation skipping tax. Um, the people who will are individuals, if they die between 2018 and 2025, who are not married and have estates of over $11 million, or who are married, and both spouses die during that period of time, and their estates are over $22 million. It's not a whole lot of people, but it's some people. The important thing to keep in mind, though, is that um, beginning in 2026, the law sunsets so that the exemption reverts back to what it would have been in 2026 had the inflation adjustments that were in effect in, uh, it had the exemption that was in effect in 2017 continued to be inflation adjusted until 2026. So roughly, if the law does in fact sunset, the exemption in 2026 will be six million dollars or so, probably a little more than that per individual, which means that a lot more people still have to think about estate planning than just people with these mega estates. So all of the things that we have been doing for years in terms of estate planning, you know, annual exclusions, gifts that consume exemption, um, grant to a retained annuity trust, qualified personal residence trust, all those kinds of things still are relevant unless you really know that your client with an estate in excess of 11 or $22 million is going to die before 2026. can't know that for that many clients, so you still have to be thinking about estate planning. Okay? A big part of the estate planning that we have traditionally done involves trusts. And the question that I probably get more than any other is the call from the client who says, my neighbor told me I need a trust. How much does a trust cost? And of course, the answer to that is, I don't know. It depends on what kind of trust you need. There are many, many features that trusts can have. And those features affect the way in which they are subject to tax. A trust can be revocable or irrevocable. A trust can be, uh, the income of the trust can be taxable at the trust level, at the beneficiary level, or at the settlor level. The trust can have a domicile in the state in which the creator of the trust lives, or it can have a domicile in another state in order to take advantage of the laws of that state. And it can be subject to the jurisdiction of one state, but the taxes of another state. And of course, then there are the dispositive provisions of the trust. All those things go into what it means to have a trust, which is why I can't answer the question when a client calls me and says, how much does a trust cost? For historically, for estate planning purposes, we often used irrevocable trusts, and we set them up as what are called grantor trusts. Because with a grantor trust, the person creating the trust, the settlor of the trust, continues to be taxed on its income for federal income tax purposes and for state income tax purposes in all but two states, one of which happens to be Pennsylvania, which doesn't recognize the federal grantor trust rules. The reason that we use grantor trusts is because if the... <coughs> Okay. Because if the settlor continued to be obligated to pay the tax, the settlor could reduce her taxable estate by the tax, and the payment of the tax is not a gift. So you can reduce your estate, but not have to consume any of your federal estate, uh, federal estate or gift tax exemption. So it's basically a tax-free gift. Those planning opportunities still make sense for individuals who are likely to be subject to federal estate tax. But 
And we've always thought about income tax planning when it comes to trusts. But with the advent of the new law, the income tax planning opportunities are greater. And the reason is the one that Gary alluded to earlier with regard to both the, the SALT limitation, the state and local tax, and the real property tax limitation of only $10,000 and the 199 Cap A 20% deduction. Those rules, as Gary said, apply per taxpayer. The nice thing about a trust is that a trust can be its own taxpayer. So it can avail itself of the, the, the sort of carve-outs, the benefits that are provided under those two new laws. And that's why I talk about multiplying the ceilings. The two ceilings that I'm talking about here, and of course there are other examples, are the $10,000 SALT limitation and the $315,000 or $150,000 limitation on the 199 cap A deduction. So the first example, and, and salty slat, I should probably have put a little R in a circle there because somebody invented that term and it wasn't me and I probably owe that individual license fees for using that term. But what this applies to is a, an irrevocable trust that is its own taxpayer. In order for the trust to be its own taxpayer, it can't be a grantor trust. In other words, it can't be a trust on which the settlor continues to be taxed on its own income. So the bells and whistles that we would normally incorporate into a trust under the traditional estate planning to cause to allow the settlor to reduce her taxable estate by the income tax, you don't want to include in a salty slat. You want it to be a non-grantor trust its own taxpayer. Um, so that you can transfer to it a portfolio of stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, and a piece of real estate, and you can, if you have at least $10,000 of income, and you have deductions of $10,000, you're increasing the number of $10,000 ceilings that are available to you. Now, you're probably thinking, gee, that's great. I can set up lots of trusts to do this. I can, if I have, if I have the more $10,000 ceilings I can use, the more I can get around the $10,000 limitation. There is an internal revenue code section that talks about um, aggregation of multiple trusts, all of which serve similar purposes and have the same beneficiaries. But that statute does not apply, at least according to what the experts are saying, until regulations are issued to implement that aggregation rule. Those regulations, although the statute is ancient, those regulations have never been issued, which means that at least as of today, you are allowed to create multiple trusts to take advantage of this $10,000 ceiling. Now, uh, Gary and Scott both said that we're waiting for regulations with regard to the rest of the act. And it may be that, that as part of the regulations that they limit the ability to use multiple trusts. But as of June 14th, 2018, those regulations haven't been issued, so the ability to create multiple trusts still exists. Um, one other comment before I move to the slide. The word slack. Um, refers to a trust in which the spouse has access. In other words, the spouse is a beneficiary of the trust. All of our estate planning clients want to have their cake and eat it too. They want to give it away but would not give it away. If they take their, their real estate and their portfolio of stocks and bonds and they transfer it to a trust, no matter how much money they left over, have left over, a lot of clients remain concerned they're going to run out of money. So with a trust to which the client's spouse has access as a beneficiary, some of that concern is mitigated because if the client runs out of money, distributions can be made to the trust for the benefit of the spouse. You have to very carefully draft the trust agreement to avoid the spouse being a beneficiary 
converting it into a grantor trust. And, and parenthetically, I'll say what that means is you need an adverse trustee. But the, the general point is, in this case, you can have your cake and eat it too, because the spouse can be a beneficiary of such a trust. Um, the second opportunity that I mentioned earlier is with the uh, 199 cap A limitation that allows each taxpayer, regardless of the, um, the, the rule that limits the 199A deduction so that it doesn't apply to the professions, and that, that includes the 50% of W-2 income or the 25% and 2.5% limitations. That doesn't apply if the income passing through to the taxpayer plus the other income available, taxable to that taxpayer is $157,000 or less or for married 315. The trust can create a new taxpayer. So if you transfer to a trust, which is, again, not a grantor trust, an interest in a pass-through entity, and the income of that trust, whether it's from the pass-through entity or from other assets, is less than the $157,000, the 20% deduction will be available. And of course, you can do that for each of the client's beneficiaries, children, grandchildren, spouse, and one other aspect of that is if in a particular year, since no one can predict what the income of a business enterprise is going to be, if the income for the trust is above the 157, then you can make distributions to the beneficiaries and they can also get the 20% deduction. Gary alluded to, and I should emphasize here, the fact that trusts reach their highest marginal rate at only $12,500 of income. So shifting income to a trust isn't always a good thing, but if your beneficiaries are all in the top bracket anyway, or if your plan is to take advantage of the lower brackets of the trust and then make distributions of the flow through income to the beneficiaries, um, then you could take advantage of their lower brackets. Or another option would be for these trusts to be Quisits qualified subchapter S trusts as to which the beneficiary is the taxpayer, and then you, then you don't have to worry about the trust rates. Um, now, uh, Howard, how does that? Um, the, the, you talked about the uh, state <coughs> local tax trust where you can have your cake and eat it too. So right. The spouse still has an income stream. Does, does that can that still be accomplished, or are you actually by putting in trust? These assets and the business interest into a trust for your children and grandchildren, are you irrevocably giving away the company and, and losing the opportunity to benefit from that? You, you are irrevocably giving it away, so that you have to be careful in how much you're giving it away, which is why the, the spousal access is so crucial in case you feel you need the cash flow later. And that sort of relates to my last comment. If this all blows up in 2025, and when a lot of the law sunsets, you're kind of stuck with this path that you've led yourself down. Um, so it is, it is important that when your clients are doing this, and this is true of, of most estate planning except the will, you really have to be sure that you'll be comfortable doing this planning, even if the law totally changes. And I always emphasize that with clients, because the federal estate tax could go away. A lot of the things that we've been talking about today could also go away. OK, so Scott. Sure. Thanks. <coughs> um, I have um, just three. Um, topics that are sort of uh, miscellaneous topics, but I thought were uh, things that we should be discussing today. And then uh, what we'd like to do is uh, give some time to get your questions and, and talk to you. And, and I have a, I have a quest question for Gary, too, at one point, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll raise that. Um, so let's talk about meal and entertainment expenses. I, I alluded to this earlier when I was speaking. Um, I, I just keep on repeating it because it's, uh, it, it, it's sort of a, many of our clients are in denial that this is uh, actually the new law. Um, effective for any amounts paid 
after December of this past year of 2017, taxpayers can no longer deduct entertainment, amusement, or recreation expenses that they incur in the conduct of their active trade or businesses. These were items that were uh, historically deductible and include things like tickets to sporting events. I, I have a list here on the slide, stadium license fees that clients were paying, private boxes at sporting events, theater tickets, golf clubs, uh, dues and greens fees, hunting and fishing trips. Uh, this is a, a pretty comprehensive list and it, it, you really have to be very, very careful. Um, the, the law has some, un, it's not exactly clear in the law about what happens under the previous end of the law, if you would incur meal expenses, you could deduct 50% of the meals that you incurred in the conduct of your trade or business. Um, the, as, as, as Harold alluded to in terms of what the, uh, our professions believe, we believe the new law has not impacted that and that that will continue to be an allowable deduction. But there is some uncertainty in the way the law was drafted as to whether this 50% deduction could be impacted. We're, we're advising our clients to, um, and the planning point here is, we're advising our clients to be very, very careful about keeping their books and records and separating their entertainment from their meal costs so that the, it, there'll be much, much more clarity towards the end of the year as to which items will be available for the uh, deductions, which will not. Um, it appears that if you take someone to a sporting event, you buy them a meal at the sporting event, that will be consumed as part of the entertainment expense and likely not deductible. But again, we need guidance in this area. We're waiting for that. And the, uh, the Treasury has been very far behind in issuing guidance at this point on, on most of the provisions in this new tax law. Um, we've, we've talked uh, quite a bit, all of us, about the new limitation on the availability of deductions for state, local income tax, and real estate taxes, which are now limited to $10,000. Um, and as, as, as Gary mentioned before, this provision does not appear to eliminate in any way the ability of an entity to deduct taxes that are imposed but on and at the entity level. So corporations that are, uh, that are a C corporation that's incurring state and local taxes or real property taxes, they'll still be able to avail themselves of a full deduction for the taxes that they're paying. But through flow through entities and, and others, it becomes uh, more problematic that these limitations are gonna come into play since most of the state and local tax you pay on a flow through entity is paid at the personal level, not paid at the entity level. In response to this, um, a, a group of states, uh, New Jersey uh, recently in particular, have been enacting legislation to try to circumvent this new rule. And uh, what they have done in, in New Jersey's case was to provide in legislation passed recently that will enable local municipalities and local governments to create charitable foundations and have their homeowners make charitable contributions into these foundations in lieu of real estate taxes or other types of taxes and then use the monies in those foundations to pay for services that would otherwise have been provided by those municipalities through their real estate taxes. So what's the game? The game is that you've converted presumably a state and local or real estate tax into a charitable contribution. Under the new law, charitable contributions are not limited, so you can, in effect, circumvent the limitation by making a charitable gift. Um, I, this is something that's, um, that's been in place in Pennsylvania now for many years. Um, many of you are familiar with what is our educational income tax credit, where companies, can, companies and individuals now can avail themselves of making a, a charitable gift to a foundation that uses that money to fund tuitions of private school and parochial schools, and you get a Pennsylvania credit of up to 90% of that amount against your Pennsylvania tax. Um, it was a very, very helpful <laughs> process under the old law for taxpayers that were in the dreaded alternative minimum tax because they were losing the benefit of their state and local tax deduction anyway, and this way they were able to convert that to a charitable contribution. So New Jersey and others are looking at these types of models now and saying, let's, let's change our entire taxing system to create a charitable deduction for, our, for our, our, uh, our residents as opposed to an income tax deduction and circumvent the $10,000 limitation. Um, 
Needless to say, uh, Secretary Mnuchin, um, very quickly following the, uh, the passage of these, these recent laws, uh, issued a statement that the federal government intends to challenge the treatment of these amounts as charitable contributions. Uh, they're likely going to be issuing regulations uh, addressing this specifically. Um, it's unclear whether a, a, uh, a system that's been in place like in Pennsylvania for many years, which was never designed to circumvent this limitation because the limitation didn't affect or get caught in the web of the regulatory process as, as the IRS goes to look at this. Uh, we're monitoring this. You just have to be very, very aware of this. Um, in Pennsylvania, uh, the amount of credit that's available for taxpayers to avail themselves of is limited. And um, our, our understanding is that uh, applications this year are going to be extraordinarily high to utilize the credits. And although Pennsylvania is considering raising the amount, it hasn't happened yet. So uh, it, it's just something to be aware of. We're, we're advising people apply for the credits. You don't have to use them if you choose not to, uh, to avail yourself of the program. But to the extent they're able to get them, you might as well have them as a planning option as, as the year goes on. Uh, so tell me to be very, very careful to monitor. Uh, the, the last item, which is uh, sort of a, um, just something I think everyone should be aware of, whether it affects uh, you, your parents, your grandparents, or, uh, or, or people that, uh, if you, those of you in advisory capacities or are working with clients who are at retirement age, um, the, the new law, we keep on talking about the, uh, the limitations that are coming through in itemized deductions. If you recall, I said that the, now the, um, the standard deduction has been increased to $24,000 for taxpayers who are married filing jointly. For, for people that now only get a $10,000 deduction for state, local, and real estate taxes, if they don't have a mortgage on their home, the only other real deduction that they're going to have on their personal tax return is charitable contributions. So they would need to be making contributions in excess of $14,000 to be able now to get a benefit of, the, of, the, of their itemized deductions. One of the ways to deal with this for people that are not giving charitable amounts in excess of that is for people who have IRAs and are, are required to take minimum distributions out of their IRAs every year. Under the law, if you're over 70 and a half, you're allowed to direct up to $100,000 of your charitable distribution, your IRA distributions annually directly to a charitable organization. That direction of those dollars directly to charity means that the money that you normally would take out of your IRA and be taxed on is no longer subject to tax. It's not, it's not treated as income. You don't get a deduction for the charity because you don't get, you're not picking up the income, but in effect you can get the ability and the availability of getting a charitable deduction and preserve your $24,000 standard deduction so you can double dip and get a charitable deduction on top of the $24,000 increase. Uh, what we did as a firm, we went through our, our entire individual client list and I tried to identify clients who are making charitable gifts in that, in that, in that range of under $15,000 annually and who are taking IRA distributions and contacted them to talk about planning. In some, they're not interested. It's too much effort for, you know, two thousand dollars. But in others, uh, it, it it is a you know a ten ten to fourteen thousand uh, dollar benefit is uh, related to on a tax after tax basis. It's, it's pretty nice. So uh, it's something to think about for people that you're working with. Um, one one sure. of the other things that people are doing with a charitable deduction is bunching their charitable contributions into one year to get over the $24,000 standard deduction amount. Um, one way to do that and still uh, honor your, your charitable giving intentions or pledges is to contribute the charitable deduction money to a donor advised fund being year one, which is sort of a private uh, charitable account. You get a charitable deduction for that but then the advisors of the donor advised fund make the payments to the outside public charity over a period of years. So while this law is in effect, you can continue the flow of charitable dollars to your favorite charities, but still take advantage of the charitable deduction by this one-time one -time contribution to a donor advised fund. Um, before we open up uh, to the, for, for questions and, and any comments, I, I just thought two, two other very brief items. 
One is um, be prepared for those of you that are going to be availing yourselves of the new uh, 199 cap A 20% business deduction to see a, an increase in your compliance and disclosure costs because uh, as, uh, as, as Gary mentioned, this, this is determined at, at the individual taxpayer level. So uh, think about a, a large flow through entity that has many, many partners. Uh, that entity is going to have to provide information to each of its owners annually that will give them the relevant amount of information so that they'll be able to report and determine what the 20% deduction is going to be on their individual tax returns. They're going to have to know what their share of income is, what their share of the W-2 wages that the entity pays. They're going to need to know what their share of the company's basis in the assets to which part of this limitation threshold is calculated. So uh, just, just be prepared to see more complicated uh, tax disclosure documents as, as we move forward. Um, the question I had for Gary was, you had talked about aggregation um, before, but, but let's, um, the other side of this is maybe you could speak briefly about disaggregation. Um, if, you, if you have a, uh, let's say, a medical practice, an, an optometrist, an ophthalmologist, who also has set up in their office a, uh, eye, an eyeglass center where you're, you're getting prescriptions filled and you're buying eyeglasses, uh, there's, there's some questions in the new law as to whether the, the uh, medical practice will taint the, uh, the eyeglass and what you have to do to preserve that, that benefit. Yeah, the uh, uh, threshold question is, you know, can you uh, uh, have multiple lines of business, some of which are good, some of which are not good, and treat the uh, ones that are good separately? Uh, there's not a nice answer to that until they issue regulations. Uh, uh, that is, there's also this question of can you take a business, usually a flow-through business, because they're easy to split apart, uh, and put it into multiple business entities, some of which are in a business that is in the favored class, uh, not in the bad class, uh, and the rest of the business in the, in the bad class. And uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to wait until we get regulations in order to see how uh, aggressive the Treasury is going to be on uh, that type of tax planning. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the hope is that you'll be able to split your businesses into good ones and bad ones and uh, uh, you know, avail yourself of the, of the uh, 199 cap A deduction in that way, uh, but we just don't know. Wow, that's a lot of information. Um, we've got about 10, 15 minutes left. Um, if there's any questions, we can go over a couple things. I have a couple questions myself, but why don't I just, you know, go ahead. Um, how is the $315,000 business income uh, pass-through deduction limit and the SALT deduction uh, limit, how is that impacted by um, the choice to file merit separate? Well, uh, can you bring the mic? Yeah, yeah, I did. The, the uh, 315 is half. To 157, uh, if you uh, have separate returns, the 10,000, however, is not. That's the same whether you uh, file as a joint return or a separate return. So the two are in that regard are not coordinated. So filing separate, you can actually get two tens. Correct. But you have to be careful because filing separate has different rate brackets. That, that, that the, your, your income gets taxed at higher brackets sooner. So uh, there, there's a cost. And uh, uh, as I indicated, uh, this creates the opportunity to take the interest in, in business entities uh, and give it to children outright or uh, a trust for children because they then get a separate run at the 157 or 315 if they're married. They get a separate run at the $10,000. and. Uh, I, even though the child goes up the brackets faster, they, they reinvented the kitty tax basically to make it the trust rates. So a child on that income will uh, uh, be taxed at a higher level. But if the parent is already at the, at the top rate, there's no harm done. Anything else from the floor? 
I wanted to ask Howard a question. You were talking about using uh, trusts and trust beneficiaries to split the income, but if you're going to have uh, S Corp stock in that trust, then you're going to essentially have to be an electing small business trust, correct? You can't be a quist because all the quist income has to flow through. So, but then you're going to pay the the maximum income tax rate. So, right. Yeah, um, I think this is where, generally speaking, people have created quists rather than esbits because of the possibility that the that the downstream taxpayer could be in a lower bracket. But um, I, I, for anybody who knows that they will all be in the highest bracket, an esbit still makes a lot of sense in part because you can include multiple um, beneficiaries within the same trust. You can accumulate income. It gives you a lot more flexibility. So I think there may be, for people who are going to be in the highest bracket anyway, there may be more thinking about using ASBITs. Remember, the ASBIT, even though it's at the high rate, the, the availability of a 20% income tax deduction against the flow-through income will still bring the the maximum right. marginal rate down, right, but below that top individual, that top rate. Anything else over here, sir? The um, the question about um, the active rentals. Mm -hmm. So the that doesn't change the classification on a personal return from a passive activity to active. The answer is no. Right. Uh, uh, that has the, the passive activity. Law schools are basically sitting on the side, and indeed that the 20% uh, uh, deduction is only on the profit, so that in, in essence uh, you, you don't want to, to run at a loss in your activity. Uh, what I was well, um, but in order to get the 199 capital deduction, it has to be a trader business and uh, very passive ownership of real estate is viewed as a 212 act, a, a transaction entered into for profit, but not a trader business. Uh, fortunately, in the case law, the quantity of service needed to, to, to make it a trader business is relatively uh, easy to meet, okay, uh, uh, without totally upsetting the economics of the deal. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, so I have a question. This is probably this is probably a question for Scott. Um, um, people in the audience or generally in the population probably are thinking, what's the simplest way for me to proceed without having to spend lots and lots of professional fees to decide, should I convert from a C to an S, from an S to a C? You know, how, how do I take advantage of the bonus depreciation without losing other benefits and things like that. Are there shorthand ways of doing this? Are there rules of thumb that, or is it just you really have to grind it out? Well, I'd love to say there's a, there's a rule of thumb and shorthand answer to this. Um, many of the types of things we talked about are traditional type of planning, although it's a little different under this law than it was under prior laws. Um, issues about punching deductions to maximize itemized deductions, things of that nature. That's, that's just part of having ongoing conversations with clients as we go through the course of the year. The issues of C versus S status, the, the availability of the 199 cap A deduction and maximizing that, um, restructuring ownership, that's going to require a you know case-by-case -case analysis as to what makes sense, what the magnitude of the benefits are compared to the cost of implementing those benefits. Because it could be that the cost of implementing a structure outweighs the tax benefits that would be put into place for trying to save, save some dollars. So, yeah, you really have to look at it. There, there are some rules of thumb on the C versus S uh, or other pass through. And uh, uh, one rule of thumb is if you really want the money or need the money in your pocket, then being the C is usually the worst uh, choice. Okay, the, the, uh, deciding to, to be or remain a C-Corp only seems to make sense where the corporation bottles up the cash to either pay down debt or grow the business. 
but if, you, if the intent is to reward the shareholders uh, either through salary or dividends, then it doesn't make sense to be a C Corp. And the other one, which is not a complicated calculation that Gary also spoke about, was in an S corporation context, the calculation of how much wage a owner needs to take in order to be able to maximize the availability of the 20% deduction. That's a very straight mathematical calculation. It's not a, it's not a complicated planning process. Um, do you see the entertainment disallowance going away? That seems to be a rather draconian rule to limit or eliminate uh, entertainment options. I, I, th I think the, the, my personal take is that I think this overall legislation was a result of multiple compromises to, to expand the base and flatten tax rates, and that each and every one of these had a revenue con consequence that, that, that were a linchpin to be able to get this legislation enacted. I, I don't see in any immediate future single provisions being you know, repealed absent some cost associated with that because they, they can't afford to do that. Right. You're, you're probably going to see in the charitable area uh, some tinkering with how charities raise money uh, because the uh, uh, fewer people are going to want to give charitable donations, but yet they, the charities could reconfigure uh, to, to sell more advertising uh, in, as part of what they do so that the businesses get a 162 advertising expense for doing something with respect to the charity. Uh, I'm just looking at this from a pure sales perspective. Part of sales is entertaining your prospect or your Absolutely. client. Yep. And if you can't take them out to play golf, if you can't take them out we're all available to play golf this afternoon. <laughs> Happy to go. You know, you can't take them uh, to watch basketball or football or baseball. I mean, all right. I, I just see, I can't imagine the entertainment industry is at all happy with this. No. They're not. not. Right? I mean, you know, the. The stadiums are going to lose money. Yeah. yeah. And the teams are going to lose money. Yeah, there's, a, there's another provision, as Bill, which I didn't speak about, that, that, which was uh, there was a provision that allowed people to stock the monies they paid to booster clubs from the universities in order to get access to tickets to the uh, football stadiums, uh, in Penn State. Uh, it, that, that provision, the availability of that deduction, was eliminated in this bill as well. So uh, they had, they're reconfiguring how they're and be looking at those types of revenue sources. Yeah, treasury might get the <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I guess we're going to find a loophole. There's an industry designed to find those right? things. So. <laughs> Why don't we go with, we got one more and it's getting on until 10, so uh, go ahead. I, I was just curious because I haven't heard anybody talk about this in the S versus C election um, where you got an S corp that's not distributing all its uh, all its profits, and therefore the shareholder um, basis is increasing. Um, it seems to me that's also a potential issue for thinking about remaining S as as opposed that's to right. coming, as opposed to the, the, C. the basis in the stock of the C corp doesn't move uh, by retained earnings, whereas it does in in the S context and. Uh, you never know when down the road that's going to be a high basis in the stock is going to be helpful. And, that, and those retained earnings might allow you to take a tax-free distribution correct. later on. That's correct. correct. <coughs> I mean, uh, 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 the, the, you still, have, on the C versus S, uh, pass through, you still have the accumulated earnings tax, you still have the personal holding company tax, so the idea of, oh, we'll just keep all the cash inside the corporation and buy a, a portfolio of stocks and bonds is not, is not going to work, okay? Never did before, and it won't work afterwards. Uh, uh, it, the, being a C-Corp seems to make the most sense where you need every nickel okay, to grow the business or pay down debt, uh, uh, and, and that your relevant people are willing to take modest salaries. Because the scenario where they just say, oh, we'll be a C-Corp, but we'll take it all, the bottom line profit out of salary, you 
just shot yourself in the foot again. 